The message that God is burning in my spirit tonight is called Experience the Resurrection Power of God. Sunday, a week ago, the Lord gave me the message, Experience the Life of God. And then this past Sunday, Pastor Don was talking about the life of God and choosing life. And so I know the Spirit is saying things to us, and he said, let every truth be established in the mouths of two or three witnesses. And since I have the witness of others and of the Spirit of God, there's a great confidence. And when I have this feeling inside of me, I know God's going to burst on the scene. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who what? For everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it, the preaching of the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. I love what Paul said about the gospel. He's not ashamed of it. Let me ask you this question. Why would any Christian be ashamed to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? If we are ashamed of it, it says more about us than it does the Word. Why would we be ashamed of the truth that literally saves our souls from hell? Can you think about that for just a moment? Let that ponder in your heart and your mind. Why would we be ashamed of something that has saved us from an eternity of fire and torment that was only meant for demons and devils? Why would we be ashamed of that? The enemy has had us broken down and busted and disgusted and defeated in our hearts and our minds because we did not know the Word of God. But more than knowing the Word of God, I want to talk to you tonight about experiencing the Christ that is the Word of God. And when you experience the Christ who is the Word, that experience with Him will cause you to have a boldness like Paul did, like Peter did, when he says, I'm not worthy to hang like my Lord and Savior. Let me hang upside down on the cross. That is a boldness that we've got to have in this generation because when this generation sees people that are on fire for God, not ashamed of the gospel, that they said Jesus died for them, but let's say it real quietly in a corner. No, when this generation hears it, boldly proclaim, they're going to get this inside of their heart. It's infectious. You can't tell me it's not infectious. Fire spreads. Say that with me. Fire spreads. It works in the natural. If we'll get on fire, we'll set fire to other people, and they'll get on fire. And before you know it, there's a revival of fire in the area, and people start getting saved, delivered, and held, and the area gets changed. So why would we be ashamed of the gospel? Let's talk about it. Hebrews Chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. He's going to inherit all things, through whom also... He made the worlds. So through the word, God has created the worlds and all things. And because through the word, all things were made, he's going to give to his son, who is the word, all things that are created. Think about that, y'all. He didn't just want the word to create. He wanted a son who would inherit all things that are created. But what God is saying, I'm not looking for somebody to have a religious experience with me. I want to have sons and daughters that I can share my goodness with, that I can share and let you inherit all things that I have created. Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying? You've been living so far beneath what God has because people didn't want to go in and they didn't want others going in and showing them as hypocrites that would go in. And God says, I've got so much in store for you. If I can get a preacher that'll be free enough to tell you what I got, you won't be able to contain it. You won't have room enough to contain it. That's what God is wanting to do. We fight over the little bit we have. And God is like, they're fighting over the toys. And I want to give them kingdoms. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person 
and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he, Christ, has purged our sins. Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than these. The Lord, as the writer says, chose to speak to his people of old through his holy prophets. They were given, the prophets were, think about this, the power to perform and to speak the supernatural into existence when the Spirit of God would come upon them. They didn't have the Spirit within them. The Spirit would come upon them, and they would receive power. They had the authority to shake nations and kingdoms. This is before the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is what the prophets of old had the authority and the power to do. They shook nations and kingdoms. Moses goes in with the Word of God, and God literally annihilates the kingdom of Egypt and buries the king of Egypt in the sea. They shook nations and kingdoms. Wow. Isn't that what we want to do? Not just go to church. Not just punch a clock. Not just say, I've got my name in the Lamb's book of life. I want to see nations shaken under the power of God. And they had the power to heal the sick. They had the authority and power to raise the dead, to shut up the heavens and to open up the heavens. But no prophet had the authority or the power to die for our sins. That's a lot of authority. That's a lot of power when they could speak to people that were dead and they'd come alive. However, under the new covenant, God has chosen to speak to us through his son. It is Jesus who has been given the authority and the power to do all things, including dying for our sins that we might become the children of God. That was God's intention all along, to make those who believe in him his children. But he had to get the sin debt taken care of so that the spirit could come. We have the ability now under the new covenant to experience God in a deeper and more intimate way than that of the saints of old could never experience. We are blessed. We have the Spirit of God living on us, and we can experience the resurrection power of God in our souls that were dead before God saved us. We're able to experience that, are we not? And we have experienced it. We are able to attend schools colleges and universities and be taught through words that will enrich us on an intellectual level there is something that takes place when people are in agreement and we are able to share what we know with one another I call it cross-pollination where we share and bring our experiences and our wisdom that God has given us and we share it with one another and in that atmosphere it can produce increase in those who are in attendance as they pour out themselves into each other's lives. However, that's on the intellectual level. There are groups, seminars, and conferences that we can attend where psychiatrists, sociologists, and psychologists share their knowledge with those in attendance that can enrich them on a soulish level. However, there is a dimension in Christ that we in the church can experience in our beings that professionals in the world cannot reach, cannot affect, cannot impact. God has given us his son, has given us his word, and has given us his spirit, and they empower us to receive God's life into our entire being, mind, body, soul, and spirit. It transcends all dimensions of your being. That's worth shouting right there. God's Word has the ability to impact and change our mind, transform our soul, but He can also speak directly to our spirits, our nature. God has made a way through Jesus to cause us to experience the life of God through His Word and through His Spirit. Now, notice the way that the Lord chose to reveal to the writer how God operates. 
his emphasis isn't on his power as to say power of his word. He didn't say it that way, but the emphasis was put on the word instead of the power. As if to say, he upholds all things by the word of his power. He speaks it and it happens. Let's think about this for a moment. He can talk to us and it barely moves us. He can talk to winds and waves on a sea that are so tumultuous it's putting lives in peril. And the winds and the waves recognize that voice. It's the same voice that spoke them into existence. That same voice that has the authority to speak into existence has the authority to speak dominion over the things that are in existence. Once you get that revelation in your spirit, you'll understand that living word is inside of me. And that same word that has the authority to bring things into existence has that same authority to speak to things things that are in existence, you have to submit to the authority of God's word in my heart and spirit that I'm speaking out my mouth. Say unto this mountain. But his emphasis was put on his word. God has made Jesus, who is the word incarnate, the centerpiece of all things seen and unseen. Through Jesus, God has raised the dead to life and has given mankind the power to come out of our trespasses and sins. No one else could do that. Only Jesus did that. We're not just washed. We're not just cleansed. We're not just pardoned. We're not just forgiven. We are made new creatures in Christ Jesus. Now that we're made alive, God upholds us, his children, by the same word of his power, that raised us from the dead. I believe God's wanting to give you a revelation, a deeper understanding of the actual power that resides inside of you. That same power that raised you from the dead, that is the same power that's going to keep you when the storms come. That's why he could say with confidence, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper because the same word that I spoke over you that brought you out of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of life, that same word is going to sustain you and keep you when the hordes of hell come after you and after your children. You're going to stand. You're going to be bold. You're going to be confident in the Lord. And you're going to know how to speak to those things and say, peace, be still, and watch peace come because you've got to take the authority that you know as a believer that you have the faith that God has given to every person according to Romans 12 3 gives mankind the ability to believe we can believe in anything we can believe in people ideas visions concepts and anything else that requires trust however there's something supernatural and spiritual that transpires when truth connects with the faith of a person who is hungry for life. There's something spiritual. Deep calling unto deep. That's what I keep hearing for two weeks in my spirit. God is saying deep is calling out to deep. I don't want to tickle your intellect. I don't want to comfort your soulless realm. I want to speak from my spirit, the spirit of God, into your spirit. And let there be some consummation that goes on in the spirit. Where there's something that's being birthed inside of you that says I can do all things through Christ. Who gives me strength? I can come out of addiction. I can come out of bondage. I can't come out of generational curses. Deep calling unto deep. The Spirit speaking expressly to the spirit of humans. Telling us what is inside of us. Because if you don't know what's inside of you, how are you going to tap into it to bring it out of you? When our faith and God's Word connects in our hearts, our dead spirits come alive. And once that takes place, the Spirit of God enters our spirit. No religion can give you this guarantee. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. He's the down portion until we are redeemed and taken out of this world. He is the earnest, if you will. It's the down payment that we will put on a car when we're going to say, I guarantee you with this down payment, I will pay this off. God gives us his Holy Spirit as a guarantee. 
I am going to finish the work that I am starting in you. It's going to be complete. And when I'm done with you, you're going to look just like my son, Jesus. But more importantly, when God gives us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And that's where our confidence comes from. Nobody in religion, there is no religion on earth that can give you the guarantee that faith in Jesus Christ can give you because there's only one true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. There's only one word. There's only one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God and Father. There is only one way into heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes and dwells inside of your spirit and bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. And when you know in your spirit you've got the evidence, there's nothing that can come against you that would separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. You'll have a boldness. The spirit of timidity will have to take a hike. I have boldness in my faith walk. Why? Not because I'm arrogant, but because I have evidence if you've got evidence, nobody can argue with you. They can argue with you till they turn blue and pass out on the ground. It will not sway you. It will not change you. It will not alter you because it wasn't you that got you saved. It was God that saved you. And he will keep those. He will keep those. We have evidence and a witness in our spirit that we are children of God. And I cannot deny what I have experienced. See, the reason why so many Christians can deny, well, preacher, do you think everybody that goes to, into the grave without Jesus Christ, do you think they're going to go to hell? What do you think about it? Well, I can't answer that right now. How do you do that? Because once you've truly experienced Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Christ, not the one before death, the one who went through death, burial, hell, and grave and came out on that resurrection morning, that Christ, when that Christ has been confirmed to you that he's inside of you, you can't deny him. It don't matter what news network interviews you and says, is there only one way or are there many ways that can go into heaven? you got to say it and be proud that Jesus Christ is the only way into heaven. It gives you boldness when you understand you have evidence. And you have a witness. It's not man's witness. It's God's witness. He's backing you up. Is this getting in your spirit? Matthew 16, 13. Strong battles require strong words. Strong faith. But you can't have strong faith without strong battles and strong words. Because Jesus says, in the hour that you need it, it shall be given to you. When our boys were babies and Benjamin wasn't even born yet, they were in safety seats behind us. We were going up the road. It was winter. And we were going to a church. We got into the curve and hit black ice before I even knew what happened. We started spinning out of control. When you spin out of control, basically, you lose control. And when you lose control, fear kicks in. But when you trust in God, the same God that saved you out of hell, the same God that went to hell for you, that God, when your trust is in God, God's Spirit will come upon you in an instant because He's a very present help in a time of trouble, and He will calm you, and He will stay you, and He'll say, now pray in the Spirit. We started praying in the Spirit. We didn't have time to say, you know what, Debbie? We need to hold hands and agree in prayer over this car. No, we started praying in the Spirit, and as we started praying in the Spirit, the car literally came to a stop and started spinning back the opposite direction. And I looked, and there was a bank behind us, and we were going straight back. And I looked, and I saw Michael in my peripheral, and the bank was headed toward him. And the Lord said, pray in the Spirit again. I started praying in the Spirit. And as we prayed in the Spirit, God stopped that car right there on ice and started turning it back around and got us turned back around in the right direction on that road. Don't tell me you've come too late because I have experienced this sermon in my life in the fiery hell. When Satan says, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to destroy your son, the devil is a liar because God will come up on you and give you a word in season that will arm you and you will take that rock and you'll throw it against that giant and that giant will fall and you'll go to church. Are you hearing it? 
Turn to Matthew 16, verse 13. And when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, Fox News says, CNN says, Twitter says, but he said, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood, intellect, didn't tell you this. It has not been revealed to you by the flesh and blood of man, but by my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto you, now in verse 17, it says, he says, that the Father revealed this to him, correct? But look in verse 18, it's not the Father speaking. He says, I also the Lord of the church says, I also say to you that you are Peter. Petros, not Petra. You are a part of the rock, and on the rock of this revelation, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, the church. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I'm so grateful that the Lord allowed this story to be written in the Word. Man did not give knowledge of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, to Simon. Man didn't do that. The Father revealed this truth to him, and this is before he had the Holy Spirit. So that tells me Simon had some level of faith in him right there. Simon didn't hear about Jesus in a sermon. God revealed to Simon's heart who Jesus is in the spirit. I appreciate the fivefold ministry. But we can't touch what God is able to speak to you in a moment by revelation knowledge. Simon had an encounter with the living God, y'all. The Father revealed this to you. He experienced the living God. And once he experienced that, he tried to deny it. There was no denying it. Now watch, he was miserable. He was miserable because he knew in his heart of heart he was denying the truth. He had already come in contact and experienced the truth. See, people do this. They get saved, gloriously filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they go through a sifting. And they start denying Jesus. And when they start denying Jesus and try to live in their sin, they're miserable. It's like persimmons. Don't touch them. Don't talk to me. You know why? He experienced God. And if you ever go back on that experience, you're going to be miserable above all else because you're denying something that you know in your heart is the truth. So don't worry about those kids that were saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. They went out into the world like prodigal sons and daughters. They're miserable. Jesse Duplantis called his mother and said, Mom, are you praying? Yes. Quit praying. I'm miserable here. Keep praying. Remember, Satan didn't have this revelation. Uh-huh. Now we're getting somewhere. Simon Peter was given the revelation. Satan didn't have this revelation. And it's worth noting that before Satan fell from his position, he was with the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God and all things were created including Lucifer by the word so Satan Lucifer was created by the word he was with the word from the day that God created Lucifer get a hold of that yet as Satan Satan runs up on Jesus who is by the way the word incarnate and he runs up on Jesus in the wilderness and for three and a half years Satan tormented, vexed, and came against Jesus, not only himself, because he left Jesus after those three temptations in the wilderness for a more opportune time, and he showed up through religious demons to tempt him yet again. And for three and a half years, Satan is taunting and tempting Jesus. And Satan never, not one time, recognized Jesus is the Word. If you be the Son of God, He never got the revelation, y'all. 
even though he had been with God, no telling how long, and knew the word, but he denied it. Even though the word of God had never changed, Satan never recognized Jesus as the word. Now, those who have faith, they can see Jesus, they see Mary, and they see Joseph. And they hear Jesus speaking, and they say, this isn't Joseph's son. This is God's son. Because I hear a sound coming out of him. And it's that sound that bears witness with my spirit that what I'm hearing is not a man I'm hearing from God. Because my spirit bears witness that this is God speaking to me through him. Satan never had that revelation. He never had that realization. And here's why. Take note. Satan's heart had become blinded to the truth through his rebellion. And he did not repent. He's blinded to it. He's in the very presence of Jesus. The same Jesus that spoke and people came up out of their coffins. The same Jesus that told a man, stretch out your withered hand, and it went straight. The same man that spoke to knees and legs and they grew right in front of him. Opened up blind eyes where there were no eyeballs in their sockets. Satan experienced all of this stuff and not one time did he have a revelation or an understanding. This is the word, y'all. Now, take what I just said and apply it to people. You can be in the presence of Jesus, but because of unbelief and rebellion, you'll never realize it. And that's sad. After the Father revealed the Christ to Simon, then Jesus revealed what the revelation of the Christ would offer to those who come to know Jesus as God's Son. First, you get the revelation. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now that you have that revelation, that understanding under your belt, let me tell you what that revelation is going to do for you. It's not about intellect where you get all arrogant. I know Jesus is the Christ. It's what that revelation does in you and through you now that you have it. It's what matters. The revealed word or the word that is experienced of God that we receive in our hearts through the Spirit of God will build us as the strongest force on earth. Wow. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by a spirit. See, God's been trying to get us to chill. We get all worked up. We hear a bad report. We get all worked up, anxious. And God says, cool it. Chill. Be still. Sit still. That's what God's been trying to get us to do. Why? Because inside our spirit dwells the strongest force on earth. And when we become one with the Spirit, we become the strongest force on earth. It won't be a force like any other force. It will be the power of God operating in and through the church. It didn't matter what the unbelieving Jews or what Saul of Tarsus or Simon the magician did in the book of Acts. It didn't matter how much Rome persecuted the church. It didn't matter what anybody or Satan did against the church. The more they were persecuted, the stronger in the word they grew, and the stronger the force became so that they were able to stand even against the gates of hell, and they broke out and went into all the world and preached the gospel, and the fire that set them in a furnace was a fire that God says, I'm going to use to send you out and set the world on fire and bring them into the kingdom of God. And what Satan meant evil, God said, I'm going to turn it around for the good. Because there's only one force on earth that Satan cannot handle. It's the force of the church that knows and have experienced the word in their lives. Once the church is built by the Lord, he said, I will build my church. He's building it. He that began a good work is going to see it to completion. But once the church is built... Even the gates of Hades won't be able to prevail against it. It won't. Never has, 
Never will. We who believe in Jesus as the Son of God and know him by the Spirit of God, we are kept. You're kept. We are kept by the Word. He keeps us so that the forces of hell can't stop us nor overtake us. All we've got to do when it seems like the enemy is overtaking us is encourage ourselves in the Lord. A Christian that will not stop long enough to get off the merry-go-round and get along with God so they can encourage themselves in the Lord is barking up the tree of defeat. You've got to encourage yourself in the Lord so that you will hear in your spirit because God will never tell you you're outnumbered, you're defeated, and you will not come out a victor. He'll never tell you that. He'll tell you, pursue. Then you're going to overtake because what you face, what you confront, you can conquer. But what you don't identify, you cannot confront. What you do not confront, you cannot conquer. So you got to identify it. See what the Lord is doing in the body of Christ right now. He's showing us identifying so that we're able to identify our weaknesses. The enemy has been using against us to hold us back and to keep us from stepping out of the boat and walking on the water to Jesus so that we can become like him. And we think because God is doing this, he's mad at us because we don't know the ways of God. And we also think, well, we're being overrun by the heathen. And they're defeating us. And so many in the church have retreated. Let's not gather together. Let's dwell in our homes. And there we will abide safely under the shadow of the Almighty. How's that working out for you? The disciples tried that. They hid out in the room after Jesus died for fear of the Jews. That didn't work well with them. So what you got to do is you got to believe in him. Let his spirit bear witness with your spirit. Let his word become one with you and you one with the word. And then God's going to say, you're going to pursue, oh Lord. But you're going to overtake. That sounds better. And without fail, you're going to recover all. Now you're talking, God. 30, 60, 100 fold. You shall recover without fail. It's already written. And they overcame him, Satan. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and loving not their lives to the death. It's already been prophesied, written in the word, it's done. We just have to be the ones that do what he says to do. Love not our lives to the death. And we shall overcome. And Satan will be defeated. He will be cast down. Because we know him by the Spirit, we are kept from the forces of hell so that they cannot stop or overtake us as the church. It's not because of us but it is because of the foundation that God through Christ has placed us upon in the Spirit. It's not us. It's what we're rooted and grounded in. Matthew 7. Be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Because if you're hearers only, you're building like an unwise man, a fool, you're building your house on sand. And when the winds come and the waves beat against it, great will be the fall of that house. But those that hear my word and do it, the Lord says, are building their house on a rock. And when the storms come, the winds blow against it, and the waves come, it's going to stand. It's not us. We need to get over that. It's not us. It's not about us. It's about who we're connected to. Are you connected and rooted and grounded in the vine? Because when Satan comes up against me, he's not coming up against me. He's coming up against the foundation that I'm standing on. And I try to get in the way. Be still. Why? You're getting in the way. Because if you enact the flesh power, you're going to hinder the Spirit of God. So if you'll be still and act dead, I'll work through you. Can you do that? I don't know. Sometimes when you play dead, the enemy just walks away. I don't want that. It's dead. Fun's done going out of it. There's no fighting them. So through Jesus, God has raised us up from the dead, has given mankind the power to come out of our transgressions and sin, in, and has made us brand new. We're new now. We're new. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. Are you? No. You're brand new. 
You've been given a new spirit, a new nature. If you've got a new nature, how can you be the same person? You can't. Now, the world doesn't believe that. There's people in church don't believe that. They'll get up and say, well, before I sing, I just want you to know I'm a sinner saved by grace. They believe that. The world believes that. So I want to ask this question. How can a person change their physical anatomy and be called a woman if they were before a man? And if we call them a man now that they're called a woman, we're transgressing their law. But if I can be saved and not be a sinner, how can they be who was a man, now a woman? I mean, if you're going to play this game, let's play fairly. Oh, wait. The world doesn't do one standard. They have two standards. There's the standard for the world, and there's the standard for the church. The church is in its own league. Everything else is of the world. You're either in it or you're not. you either serving or you don't. you either hot or cold. See, that gray stuff, all that came from that gray matter. It didn't come from black and white. I don't know why God said go there, but he said go there, so I'm gone there. Now I'm going to move on. It's not because of us, it's because of the foundation. The foundation that we stand on and live by keeps us from evil or being shaken. Therefore, the church will stand and go on even though it is tried by fire. The word of God's power cannot fail. The powers of Satan and the demonic world cannot prevail against God's word. It cannot. We know this. We have evidence. This is not conjecture. It's not hearsay. It's not my opinion. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God has been proven to be true with more evidence than any other book ever written throughout history. I'm not talking about, well, they had a good day where a lot of things were confirmed. I'm talking about it's been confirmed over and over again throughout the nations of the world, throughout the history of mankind. This word has been authenticated. It has been tried by fire. It's been tried by dictators. It's been tried by kingdoms that tried to tear it up and tear it down. And the more they came against it, the more it has spread. And the word of God has outlived all its enemies. When I say the word of God's power cannot fail and the powers of Satan and the demonic forces cannot prevail against God's word, we know this because Jesus took on the sins of the world as a man and as the approved acceptable offering for sin. He took on the entire sins of the world because God's not willing that any should perish. Jesus also, while he is taking on the sins of the world, he also faced off with Satan himself, faced off with the rulers of darkness, faced off with principalities and powers in the last hours of his life. He also took on death, hell, and the grave, and he overcome all of these. He took them on, and he was one man, and he overcame death, hell, the grave, sin, and Satan, and the flesh. It's all been done away with. He says, all authority has been given to me. That's what he said, wasn't it? Therefore, we know that Jesus has all authority to keep us when we face any of the aforementioned. That's powerful, y'all. There's something getting inside of my spirit about this having evidence and having witness. That kind of stuff that says, I face death itself and cannot deny that he's alive. You can't fight somebody that's the walking dead. You can't. What are you going to do to them? Kill them? They're already dead. I am crucified with Christ, yet it is not I who lives, but it's Christ who lives through me. And the life I live, I live by faith in Him. We just love this world too much. Amen or oh me? Turn with me to Hebrews 3 as we head this on. Hebrews 3.15. 
while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, he's speaking. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all, say all, who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Says they all rebelled. Now with whom was God angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he, God, swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, say therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear. See, reverential godly fear has got to come back to the church. Let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel, the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation to the Jew and also to the Gentile. But, for indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, so I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. We have heard and we have read from God's word how powerful God's word is and how nothing that is created can stand against God's word once it has been released or revealed by the, the Father. Nevertheless, nothing can stop it. Nothing, y'all. Look at all that Jesus did, y'all. Came up against hell. Came up against Satan. Came up against the principalities, Rome, Israel, Jews. He came up against all of it while carrying the weight of sin on his back. And he overcame all of it. Nothing stopped the word. Nevertheless, we can allow unbelief to keep the word of God's power from impacting and profiting us. If we should harden our hearts against the truth when we hear it and or when we read it. Wow. The Word of God can obliterate anything except unbelief. What would cause someone to harden their heart after they've seen all that God does? Unbelief. But it's deeper than that. Turn with me to uh, Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, verse 17. But if your heart turns away so that you do not what? Hear. That means hear and act. Heed. And are drawn away. Aha. So if you get to the point where you don't want to hear the word of God, you don't want it mentioned around you, and you start to get drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. No ifs, ands, or buts. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life. He is your what? He is our life. That's what he's wanting you to experience his life, and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Imagine, imagine, to have your attention, all that God and the church could accomplish in the earth if it wasn't for hardened hearts of unbelief. There would be no limitation. Dead souls could be raised up, brought to life. Lives, families, and homes could be restored just like that. There is nothing that could stop the church if there was faith in hearts of those who hear God's word spoken into their spirit. Nothing. Now turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. We're going deep. Just hang on with me. Verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, we have received mercy. 
we do not lose heart. We do not faint, in other words, in doing well. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled or hidden, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, the God of this world, the one who has blinded himself, the God of this age has blinded. They've let Satan, the God of this age, blind them because they do not believe. Something else has their attention so that they will not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord, the revealed Christ, and ourselves your bondservants for Christ's sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Where did he do that? Genesis 1-3. Let there be light. And God has shown that light into our hearts to give what? Light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There it is. He shined that light. He had to shine that light in Genesis 1-3 because truth had to come in to... Oh, God, I feel that. Truth had, to, truth had to come in to an atmosphere that was total darkness. It's time for the church to break through the barriers of the people that are in high places that have shut us down on social media, on television, in the movies, wherever. It's time for the church of God to permeate and go through the limitations of darkness so the light of gospel can shine in people's hearts. Come on, somebody, get a hold of God right now. This has got to break. This has got to break. You're hearing revelation knowledge. God's telling you what's going to happen. Let there be light. It's not by might. Well, we argue them. Though we won't. It's not by might nor by power. Well, we all think them. We'll outsmart them. No, we're going to out-pray them. No, we're going to pray them out. There is a suppression of the truth and righteousness that is occurring in America as I speak. People in places of authority, prominence, and influence are instigating this spiritual suppression that is also at the same time causing spiritual oppression have you ever felt oppression like we're having right now it's because of repression they're repressing this by their unbelief you can't do that here I was watching the last man standing last night forgive me and they had Willie from Duck Dynasty on and of course Uncle Si and they were trying to help uh, what's his name Kyle yeah. I'm glad I'm not Kyle. He was feeling mighty low. And so Willie was giving him scripture. The Lord, he is God. He is one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body, and your neighbors yourself. So Kyle perked up. He says, I can do all things through him. He didn't say Christ. He said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, we've really been trained. We can't say Christ because we'll offend. Who are you going to offend? And, and by the way, if Christ and Jesus has no authority and we're just a bunch of has-beens hoping for something that might be, then why does the name of Christ offend people? Amen. So say it. Jesus. When they say it offends, say Jesus. Because when you start saying Jesus and offends people, they're going to be some demons manifested, and then you whoop out your Superman cape. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, come out, come out, come out, and be saved. I'm not playing church. There's too much at stake. I'm going through too much hell. I'm in it to win it.
Isn't that what Paul said later on in Romans 1 that we read? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What has been revealed to them, they know, but they suppress it. It cracks me up. These same actors, actresses, ball players that will not mention Christ when they're in a situation where they feel comfortable, maybe on Huckabee, maybe in a Christian's environment, they'll say, I'm a believer. I know Jesus. But get them in front on the world stage. If you deny him before men, Jesus said, I will deny you before the Father. You're going to lose more than your platform. I don't know why God's had me go there. You'll lose your soul. He will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Matthew 11, there's hope. We want to leave you with hope because God is a God of hope. Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27. All things. Our scripture, backing it up. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden. Has anybody been laboring and you're in heavy laden? You're just under the weight of the afflictions of the taskmasters, the demons that oppress you. And I, the Lord, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find what? Wait, the Jews didn't find that rest because of unbelief. But when you learn of him, take on his nature, you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus summed up this message in verse 27. It took me almost an hour to convey it, but he said it in one verse. All things have been given to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Jesus is the love of God personified. He is. If Moses represents anything... It represents the law and the wrath of God. Because Moses, though he was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, was not allowed to go in himself. He was not allowed to enter into God's rest. He died over here with the unbelievers. Wow. No mercy. Because what he represented could not go in. But Joshua represented Jesus. And he took him in. If a person is so hard in the heart that they would reject Jesus. Get this, y'all. If they're so hard in the heart in America that they would reject Jesus and the love that he offers, there is no hope for them. It's over. However, if there are people who hear this message and you're weary from your sins, you're weary from your trials and afflictions, and you want to find rest for your soul, all that is required is that you know Jesus by revelation of the Spirit. He's got to be revealed to you. Then you will experience the resurrection power of God in your dead and dry souls. So we, we're not ending, has instructed me to pray for you. And we're going to agree right now. For resurrection power of Christ to come right where you're watching tonight, where you're listening Father, in the name of Jesus, just lift your hands up. We speak and release the resurrection power of Christ into the dry, and if the case is dead souls, we speak the resurrection power of Christ come into those dead souls and bring them to life so that they will know you in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And they will know you by the Spirit. This is your opportunity to know the Christ. Confess your sins. Tell God, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. I confess that I have committed sin. And I have a sinful and a endemic nature that needs to be replaced by the nature of God. 
and I receive Jesus as my Savior, my hope, and my Lord. And I receive your Spirit. And I boldly pr profess that I am a child of God. If you prayed that, let us know. We'd love to send you some material.